a lecturer here at SOMAS, and I'm also the um, academic coordinator for the NCP program. Uh, and I'm very happy to uh, introduce Dr. Larry Crowder today. Larry is the science director for the Center for Ocean Solutions, which is a collaboration between the Packard Foundation and uh, Stanford University. He's also a professor of biology at Stanford's Hopkins Marine Station, um, and is also a AAAS fellow, among many other things. Um, Larry's research centers on food web interactions and on population and food web modeling and conservation biology. And much of his recent work focuses on really large scale and even global, global scale uh, marine conservation issues and particularly uh, developing interdisciplinary approaches to dealing with different conservation problems. Uh, so today Larry's going to talk to us about um, the bycatch in uh, with marine megafauna and different uh, issues and solutions associated with caffeinated yet this morning, so here go. <laughs> so, um, so it's a real pleasure to have a chance to uh, be here. I'm, I'm uh, wireless, so I don't have to stand by the mic, which is good. Uh, can everybody hear me? All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to give a talk about, um, about bycatch in marine fisheries um, and the variety of different methods uh, that have been used to take a look at that. Uh, most of the work came from a four-year project that was funded by Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation that was called Project Global. Um, and you always need an acronym, and this is a, this is a, a small think one. It's the GLOBE, right? Uh, Global Bycatch Assessment of Long-Lived Species. Carl Savino was a partner uh, in that project. Um, and uh, I apologize, Carl, this is mostly gonna be old to you. Uh, but um, there will be, uh, I hope, a lot of new things that people haven't seen. Um, and uh, this, is a, this was a very productive project. It was a monster to manage, we had six PIs, seven postdocs, two or three research tech kind of people, um, and several graduate students. So it was, a, it was a fairly big project to manage. So for those of you who don't know what bycatch is, in simple terms, it's the unattended capture or entanglement of, of fishing, fishing gear. Uh, in other words, these are things that the fishermen have no intention to uh, to catch and uh, don't desire to catch. Often they damage gear, uh, but the gear also does a lot of damage <clears throat> to species that people have concerns about. A lot of bycatch is um, uh, fish that aren't marketable or aren't, aren't sizes and species that have markets, and a lot of the bycatch uh, are marine mammals, seabirds, sea turtles, which was the focus of this study. Um, it's an old problem, biblical. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, you know, the, the data for fisheries, if we just look at the fish bycatch, um, a review that was done back in 1995 suggested that, you know, probably a full third of what was caught in global fisheries was bycatch, and it was dumped. Uh, a more recent study that was finished uh, a decade later um, suggested that that fin fish bycatch has been reduced to from 30% or so down to about 7%. And you'd say, a vast improvement where we, we reduced the bycatch. Um, but uh, there are several alternative explanations. We reduced the reporting of bycatch. A lot of things that were bycatch are now retained and sold, and so they're catch, and so on. But it's clear that when people use non-selective fishing gears, like trawls and gillnets and things, they catch a lot of things that are not the main target of the fishery and do, don't have the most value for them. Um, as you all know, global fisheries have uh, stabilized. Um, and this is an old graph, but basically we have 20 years uh, of increasing effort in global fisheries that haven't increased fish catches. Uh, Daniel Pauly and the Sea Around Us Project uh, have, a, have a current project called Reconstructing Global Fish Catches, um, where you know, everyone recognizes the limitations of the FAO data because it's what countries report to the FAO and they just report it back in the data set. And uh, what it suggests is that marine fish catches may be vastly higher than has been reported to the FAO, in part because of underreporting and in part because of whole sectors of fisheries, like the whole world small scale fishery, that hasn't really entered these statistics. And uh, I'll say more about small scale fisheries later. Um, so when we begin thinking about the impacts of fishing and the impacts of bycatch and so on, we have to think about there being a variety of fishing types. Almost all of the work has been done on commercial fishes, uh, commercial fishing, draggers that take benthic fish and long lines that take pelagic fish. 
but there's a very large extraction associated with the recreational industry that the artisanal or subsistence or small scale fisheries that remove a lot of biomass from various parts of the marine food web. And those impacts cascade into different components of that food web, uh, including the effects of discards on the decomposer components of the food webs, um, especially the removal of top predators and the potential for not just impacting the tuna stocks, but all of the things that the tuna eat via trophic cascades. And um, you know, a, a decade ago, people thought trophic cascades only occurred in lakes. There's now overwhelming evidence that trophic cascades can also occur in marine ecosystems and affect the food web down to, uh, down to the expression of primary production. Obviously, there are lots of environmental factors that influence the, in which this whole thing is nested, the, the habitat, uh, but also uh, climate change, pollution, eutrophication, uh, environmental variation that are out of the control of fisheries managers. Uh, fisheries managers manage the fishery, but they don't manage the nutrient inputs. They certainly don't manage the climate. A lot of people are in denial that there is a climate problem to manage. So uh, we obviously have a lot of work to do. And uh, the, the purple arrow here is uh, trying to recognize that in order to manage this complex system, uh, we have another complex system called governance that tries to take that information, the performance that we see in various response variables, and manage activities to improve performance. And one could say, we haven't done a very good job of that. And I hope that will become clear uh, through the presentation. So a lot of people are concerned about bycatch because they're concerned about the so-called charismatic megafauna, the large numbers of endangered species, sea turtles, seabirds, marine mammals, sharks that are taken inadvertently. If we were killing them on purpose, it might feel a little bit more comfortable than killing them by accident, uh, and having species on the brink of extinction by accident. Um, so uh, this is a leatherback sea turtle, uh, 100 million year plus evolutionary history on Earth, literally on the brink of extinction. Um, and, uh, especially in the Pacific, the populations have declined in excess of 95%. Since we started taking data, and there's probably vast declines before we started taking data as well. Um, the good news on leatherbacks is the Atlantic turtles seem to have turned the corner, and they're coming back a little bit. Uh, and um, That's a two beer story, so we need to talk about when we can get together to do that beer part. So the key problem with bycatch in fisheries is a lot of the animals that people have concerns about with respect to bycatch have vastly different life histories than the target of the fishery. Okay? So if you use simple cartoon kind of fishing theory on what kind of fishing effort you ought to conduct to uh, achieve uh, a sustainable yield, uh, if the target species are short-lived, rapid reproducing, have really high fecundities, they can be fished at a much higher fishing effort than the long-lived, slow-reproducing, vulnerable species. So sharks taken as bycatch in a fishery that's targeting a tuna that reproduces at age three or four are always going to be out of sync with each other. Um, and the fishing effort, which makes sense from a harvest perspective, may not make sense from a, from a bycatch species perspective. Um, and, and that's, you know, you could say the evolutionary, the evolutionary error they made was evolving life histories that have involved living a long time and reproducing over a long time period and all that kind of thing. Um, they're not well co-evolved to deal with humans. Uh, but then the sea turtles that I started working on initially have, have 35 or 40 million evolutionary, million year evolutionary history and leatherbacks over 100. Uh, humans have been around about four. So uh, we're newcomers and they're not, they're not ready for us. Um, the, the, the impacts of human activities on Marine animals are really diverse. There are lots of different stages in the life history, particularly of something like a sea turtle. Marine mammals and seabirds, um, uh, their young uh, are uh, basically become free ranging at close to adult size. So the behavior of the young isn't vastly different than the behavior of the adults compared to the fishes and the sea turtles where um, the early life stages of sea turtles live an entirely different lifestyle in an entirely different place. Uh, than the adult sea turtles. And so um, we have these various life stages um, where we start with, uh, let's start at the green box at the top, the uh, terrestrial system. This is, this is what you've seen on Discovery Channel with the little, uh, the little hatchlings running off the beach to lively music, sometimes <laughs> ominous music. You know, somebody's gonna eat them, right? 
Um, this whole stage is 60 days. That's the stage that we know most about for sea turtles. The nesting to hatchling stage, which is two months of uh, a decades long life history. Uh, when they move offshore, they swim uh, rapidly offshore to something like on this coast, the Gulf Stream, where they accumulate in uh, rafts of sargassum and so on. Uh, they, they spend not Archie Carr's lost year, but the last decade or more uh, out here in the open ocean zone for something like a loggerhead. For the leatherback, they spend most of their life history way out in the ocean zone. At some point, they come back close to shore uh, to mate and to nest and all that kind of thing. And so you have a lot of interactions in this circle and a lot of places where humans can impact them in a variety of different ways. And so the, the way I originally got pulled into this was as a population modeler helping develop one of the first uh, population models for a sea turtle species, uh, which we thought was a really interesting, fun thing to do. And then it ended up getting picked up and influencing national policy with turtle excluder devices uh, in the fisheries throughout the US and it's actually gone global. So, don't underestimate when you're doing research the impact it could have, and I, I would be unfair to tell you that we imagined all those impacts when we did the research. And there's other research that I think is just as important, but it hasn't had that kind of impact. So what, what we can do uh, using population dynamics is compare these different life stages and the different vulnerabilities in those different life stages, the number of animals that are lost, uh, with, uh, with a ruler that's scaled by the reproductive value of the animal. A lot of people who work on sea turtles are really attracted to all the little hatchlings that die or the eggs that die, but their probability of ever making it to be an adult was really small anyway, compared to the probability of a sub-adult animal that's in the water. Uh, so the question is, if you were, if you, someone asked you, what if you had a threat that killed 10,000 hatchlings and a long line fishery that kills 60 sub-adults, which of those has a bigger impact on the population? Chances are you couldn't answer that without the assistance of some kind of model, which tells you the relative uh, potential of individuals in those life stages to contribute to the future population. So you can use these kinds of approaches to scale these impacts. Um, the um, the uh, loggerhead recovery team, of which I was a part, uh, finished its report. And what we were trying to do is respond to the critiques of recovery uh, uh, um, documents that list you know, hundreds of things you can do, but it really doesn't give you any priorities about which of those things you can do uh, to have the greatest impact. And what we did was go through, you can still go online uh, to the loggerhead recovery plan and click on each of these matrices that has the life stages crossed with the threats. And for each of those, we document from the literature how many animals die due to uh, being lost on the beach because of beach lighting, okay? And how many animals die in longline fisheries um, and then we convert those to equivalent units by scaling them by reproductive value. So, you know, a, a, an adult is worth way more than a hatchling. And it's kind of first principles population biology. If you could save an individual sea turtle, an adult nesting female crawling up the beach is the individual, because that's like first and 10 on the two inch line, right? Compared to saving, how many hatchlings would you have to save to do that? It's probably thousands or tens of thousands. Um, and so what we can do is scale these uh, to what the total threats are. And the, the red boxes here are the threats which turn out to scale the highest. So bycatch um, of juveniles and adults um, in uh, coastal nearshore fisheries. Um, there are others over here, red boxes. Eggs having to do with ecosystem alterations like alterations of nesting beaches and things which you can do something about. And there are enough individuals that die that that's substantial. Some of these like species interactions um, and uh, are harder to manage because you're talking about sharks eat sea turtles. So should we fish out the sharks to protect the sea turtles? Probably a lot of you wouldn't think that would be a good idea. Um, and so when you scale these, not from the, the this, this one is the raw numbers and it draws a lot of attention to the egg stage. But when you scale it by reproductive value, you get something rather different in fact the egg stage, the early life history stages virtually fall out as being unimportant. And the, the, the brown ones or cordovan or whatever that is are the ones where the life stages and processes that are really important. This is the breakout by all the different fisheries types um, for when we did this study. And so what it points to is pelagic longlines for juvenile loggerheads and trawls 
for juvenile loggerheads in the near shore zone. Uh, trawling gets a lot of adults also in the near shore zone. Uh, what do we have over here? These are demersal long lines, demersal gill nets. And so what it allows you to do is say, so um, you know, I, let's get away from the numbers of animals that die. And let's get at the population level impact with those numbers that die. And concentrate on if we were going to do one thing, what would have the greatest impact. And when we did the original loggerhead model, one of the striking things was two key results. One was if you simulate with that crude, crude kind of model, which was based on the crude kind of data we had then and frankly still have, you would say all the efforts to protect eggs on nesting beaches can only prolong time to extinction, given the risks that the turtles were occurring at sea. And this wasn't a, tur this wasn't a message that the sea turtle community wanted to hear. Because up until the late 1990s, everything we did was about protecting eggs on nesting beaches and protecting nesting habitat. In this model, the decline rate goes from 5% a year to 3% a year if you have 100% survival in the first year of life. Not going to happen, right? Um, so you've got to intervene someplace else in the life history. And then the other part of the analysis showed that if you could act in one life stage to reduce mortality and have the greatest impact on population growth rate, you'd reduce mortality in the large juvenile stage, sub-adult stage, of these turtles, which coincidentally is exactly the stage that gets killed in bottom trawls in vast numbers. Turtle excluder devices had been invented completely independently of this analysis, but this analysis and one other paper really pushed the US over the edge to put turtle excluder devices into the fishery because it was, it was a coincidence, a fortunate one, that if you fix that problem, you're doing actually the most effective thing you can do. Now, this approach doesn't tell you what to do. It gives you still a variety of alternatives. And some of these things may be heavy lifts to do politically or very expensive to do, and others may be pretty inexpensive to do. So what you're doing is trying to ultimately you want to look, look at the lambda d dollar in terms of what you decide to do. So we extended from kind of looking at one species to looking at a variety of species. Um, and this is focusing on the sea turtle data. Um, we gathered all of the global longline effort data and made a global longline effort map for the year 2000. Um, and you can see actually that most of the global effort now occurs in the southern hemisphere. Uh, Ram Myers would have argued be, that's because we've depleted a lot of fisheries in the northern hemisphere and kind of moved on. Uh, it also suggests that it's very dangerous to be a sea turtle in the Mediterranean, and, and probably has been for thousands of years. Um, and so when you put this all together, 40 nations in, in 2000 set 1.4 billion uh, hooks, 3.8 million hooks per night on average, targeting swordfish and tunas. Um, and uh, a lot of loggerheads and leatherbacks are taken in that process. Uh, getting this long line map put together was extremely difficult to do. And it's very coarse, it's five degree squares. So it doesn't tell you anything about a local scale oceanographic feature or anything where these act this action really occurs. Um, we, we focused on the Pacific because the Indian Ocean data are really uncertain and so on. Um, and, uh, and we looked at loggerhead bycatch and leatherback bycatch. Um, and uh, these are the numbers from this study, which was 2004. There's a recent study uh, that Brian Wallace finished with a team of co-authors. I'm on there somewhere in the et al list uh, that, that estimates you know, uh, half a million or so uh, turtles per year taken in global fisheries um, in, the, in the overall system. Um, that's half a million, yeah, half a million uh, if you scale up. Uh, for given the densities of turtles we estimated from simple population models are in the Pacific, loggerheads and leatherbacks have about a 50-50 chance of encountering longline gear each year. Now, if you, do the, if you do the mental model, you'd say, put the longline hooks sort of out there at random, and the turtles out there at random. You'd never anticipate that kind of contact rate, right? It's like impossible to imagine, and I didn't do the calculations, but if you did the null model, you'd say, yeah, no turtles would ever find a longline hook. The interesting thing is that we're not fishing the whole Pacific Ocean. We're fishing particular places, usually like the North Pacific Convergence Zone, which is a buffet line for everybody. And when you go fishing swordfish there, you encounter tunas. Uh, and you encounter tunas, you encounter turtles, uh, all the variety of things. And so, um, you know, uh, when we did this paper, we concluded, the more loggerheads and leatherbacks are killed each year by pelagic longlines than nest throughout the Pacific. Now that sounds wrong right off the bat because how can you kill more than nest? 
except that they're killing, remember, all the life stages or with a certain like 30 centimeter turtles up to 80 centimeter turtles or in the case of leatherbacks up to 150, 160 centimeter animals. So, um, you know, it, it does suggest that we're pushing those populations really hard. Um, when we began Project Global, we, we, uh, our charge was to go beyond sea turtles to look at a variety of other species. And the reason why that's really important is that you can't get into a situation where you solve the problem for one species and create a problem for another. Um, like you, you have a lot of people out there that are seabird fans or marine mammal fans or dolphin huggers or whatever you want to call them. But you don't want to, you don't want to solve the problem for dolphins and create the problem for sharks, right? Um, at least that would seem unwise. You also don't want to say, let's go for the global high seas drift net ban, which happened in 1992. And the fishermen rolled the drift nets off and rolled the long lines on. Becca Lewis and I have a paper that shows for albatrosses in the Pacific, the same number of albatrosses die on the long lines that died in the drift nets. Problem not solved, at least that part of the problem not solved. So we wanted to look at multiple gears and multiple taxon groups, and of course, we were crazy enough to think that this was something that's smart to do. So um, I, I started thinking about how we could conceive of this problem, and this is my Boy Scout training. Is there any Boy Scouts out there? <laughs> OK, there's this thing called the FIO Triangle. And they're mostly thinking about little Boy Scouts not running around with their uniforms on fire. I mean, that's the key thing, right? But you know, if there's a fire, it involves fuel, air, and heat. And if you want to stop the fire, you break one of those triangle axes, and you stop the fire. You smother the fire, you remove the fuel, you remove the source of heat. Right? So when the Boy Scout's running across the campsite with his uniform on fire, you roll him in a sleeping bag right? to deprive the fire of air. And you sure as hell, like if you have a grease fire, the best thing to do, of course, is throw water on it. And you know. <laughs> okay, so, so I began thinking about the bycatch problem from this perspective and see if this works for you, it may or may not. So I came up with the bycatch triangle, okay? And basically, um, bycatch occurs in high numbers when you have this conspiracy of fishing activity occurring in particular oceanographic conditions, which are determined by the oceanographic features, um, and non-target species also happen to aggregate in those features. So if you don't have a fishery and the non-target species are aggregating these features, you don't have bycatch, right? If you don't have oceanographic features that draw these animals into the same region, they're often very prescribed region of the ocean, you don't have bycatch. If the non-target species aren't there, you can freely fish for swordfish without having any impact on turtles. The train wreck occurs when these things conspire, okay? And so what we knew, knew that we needed to understand was what we, all that we could about the oceanographic conditions, which set up these circumstances, the various fishing activities, some fishing gears, and setting methods are more deadly than others, and about the behavior of the bycatch species. Obviously, if you really wanted to study this, you'd say we want habitat models for the swordfish, not just the turtles, and oh yeah, for the fishermen, not just the swordfish. Okay, and I'm gonna show you an example where we do an elaborate modeling procedure to do dynamic habitat modeling, modeling for seabirds using satellite tagged seabirds. You could use satellite tagged fishing boats if you can access the data, right? And there are fishing boats that have VMS on them. So, you know, we looked at oceanographic features uh, that influence the distribution of target and non-target species. And there are a lot of remotely sensed variables that you can uh, work into various habitat models that might drive the behavior of these animals. Um, most of these models are done with simply simple remotely sensed data like temperature, chlorophyll, sea surface height, um, you know, the, the ways of uh, determining where fronts and eddies are and all that kind of thing. There's a lot of seasonal uh, spatial variation in these features. Um, the problem is that sea turtles don't eat chlorophyll, okay? So there's often a missing link in these food web links between the remotely sensed measure we have of primary productivity and the secondary uh, items that uh, these predators are consuming. And so. Uh, seabirds aren't eating chlorophyll either, but they're often aggregated in places where there's a lot of chlorophyll producing a lot of plankton, blah, blah, blah. Okay, in terms of fishing types, you probably have all seen these various kinds of fishing gears. Um, and a lot of what the public perceives about these fishing gears is really uh, like 
if not just misleading, totally wrong. Uh, how many people have seen that movie that was out years ago, The Perfect Storm? Okay, it's a just compelling movie about long lining um, off, the, off the New England. Um, and you saw the story, it's very dramatic. You're out for days and days, you're not catching anything. And then all of a sudden you're catching all kinds of things. And then the ominous threat happens, dun, 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 dun. They pull up a shark instead of a swordfish. And of course the shark immediately grabs a fisherman by his boot and be begins dragging him into the ocean. Well, that was really cool storytelling Hollywood style. And I think it does show the pressure that's on these fishermen. And frankly, bycatch isn't the main thing they worry about. They worry about living through the next cruise, right? But the real story of that time of year and that place in terms of catch and bycatch is that they catch twice as many blue sharks as they catch swordfish. So it really looks like a blue shark fishery with a swordfish bycatch, not a swordfish fishery with a blue fish, a blue shark bycatch. And so um, three sharks on the deck of that boat was like way under telling the story about shark bycatch in that particular fishery. So we also looked at, as I said, sea turtles, sea turtles, marine, sea turtles, seabirds, marine mammals. We did look at sharks, rays, and skates, and fin fish. Um, but you know, most of the study was concentrating on uh, the seabirds, sea turtles, and marine mammals. Just so you have some idea from recent estimates of how many animals are taken, or the biomass. This is the Kelleher paper that came out in 2005 that says 7.3 million tons per year in global fisheries. That's about 10% of the, about 7% of the reported catch um, to FAO. Um, it's probably wrong, but it seems like a big number nonetheless. Um, in, the 2000, in the 1994 paper that was published, that figure was about uh, 25 to 30 million tons. Sharks rates, skates and rays, uh, 700,000 tons per year. Um, often fish, um, when they're reported, aren't reported as individuals, they're reported as biomass. This would be like tons of songbirds in the New England forest, you know, which we don't usually think of reporting them that way. So when fish become commodities, um, they're no longer individuals, they no longer have families, <laughs> but they're just pounds of fish. Um, marine mammals from a paper that Andy Reid did, about 650,000 a year. Um, loggerhead turtles, uh, our estimate was a quarter of a million a year in the longline fisheries alone. Um, Brian Wallace's paper pushes that to at least a minimum of a half a million dollars, half a million dollars, half a million individuals per year. Um, uh, and, and that's probably a vast underestimate, but big numbers. Um, Seabirds, BirdLife International reports 300,000 per year, including albatrosses in long lines alone. So um, the numbers are big, and whether that's a concern depends on the status of the populations. And if you have hundreds of thousands of animals killed from a population of hundreds of millions, it's like, not to worry, right? But if you have hundreds of thousands killed from a population that's probably only a few million, then there may be something to be concerned about. Um, and uh, so, you know, whether a long line is a big, long I catch this big deal, it depends on the context. So the consequences that we were looking at is um, uh, because most of these mega vertebrates uh, have long lives and reproduce late, um, and they're particularly susceptible to bycatch, uh, we need to take a look at those, uh, at those species. And in some cases, uh, we need to separate uh, vulnerability from susceptibility. Um, some of them are vulnerable just based on their life history. Living a long time and having a low fecundity puts an animal at risk relative to a bycatch in a fishery. But some of these animals are actually attracted to the fishery, where they live in areas where they, they're primarily distributed in areas where the fishery is very intense. So that simply makes them more susceptible. Like a lot of the seabirds, the albatrosses that die, actually die diving on the set hooks with the fish on them, right? So if they weren't like scrounging fish uh, that the fishermen were tossing in, their mortality rate would be lower. Um, uh, the other thing we know that is organisms with these kinds of life histories have really slow recovery rates. So if you intervene and change the rules somehow, like maybe turtle excluder devices did in the trawl fisheries in the US, you can do the modeling and find out that, you know, uh, when the congressman says two years later, did that work? You can't answer that question. In fact, we're talking about 50 or 60 years 
before we know fully whether those, uh, whether those uh, approaches will work for recovery of the loggerhead population in the southeast U.S. And so it, you have to have reasonable expectations. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I learned really early when I started talking to the sea turtle biologists, who, some of whom started working on nesting beaches when they were children, um, if you're going to work on long-lived species like sea turtles, you should plan to start early and live a long time. <laughs> okay? Otherwise, you'll never have the data. When I was in graduate school, everyone was studying fruit flies and mealworms because if you're going to do population dynamics, you want an animal that reproduces fast. Okay? And that you can manipulate. So when we started this project, we recognized we needed to have a global scale assessment. Uh, we wanted to take a multi-taxi, multi-gear approach, a multinational approach. And we wanted to integrate data on bycatch, fishing effort, and oceanography on regional, ocean-wide, and global scale. So it's a small job. Um, and, <laughs> and this was largely conceived by uh, Becca Lewis, and who was a, was a postdoc with me and then is now on the faculty at San Diego State University and Carl, I think, played a big role in writing the original proposal. And for some reason, Gordon and Betty Moore were crazy enough to fund this. And after we got funded, we said, now we have to do it. You know, so that's, you know, it's lovely to get funded, but sometimes you get funded for projects. You, you know, after it was funded, Becca and I said, let's let Larry do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, they wrote the proposal and I sold the proposal to Gordon and Betty Moore and then we were all saying, oh my God, now we have to do it. Um, so, you know, this is an older uh, map as well, but uh, all this is on, online. If you look at Project Global, it's still live, um, even though the project ended a couple of years ago. And, and we, we kind of map where in the world all the studies are, and if you hit one of those little uh, bumps, it pops up the study, the reference, the key results, and all that kind of thing. So it's all pretty well cataloged. Um, and I want to give just a couple vignettes. As part of this, we had to do a uh, what were called country profiles on each of the countries. There were something like 140 nations that we fantasized we would go find the fishing effort data for and the bycatch effort data and the species distributions and so on. It turns out that for commercial fisheries, um, uh, offshore commercial fisheries, those data are pretty readily available. Uh, in some countries, for industrial fisheries where there's a large commodity value and as a result a large research program, pretty available. In small-scale fisheries, virtually not available at all. Um, and I'll tell a little bit more, more of that story in a minute. So um, country profiles were interesting uh, to develop. And then we also had groups that looked at specific gears or specific taxon. Um, Ramunas Zydelis was, uh, I first met him when he came to Duke as a global fellow in marine conservation back in 1999 or something. Um, but he was also a postdoc on this project. And he's a seabird expert, so he got the seabird job. And, and uh, this is an example of a paper that he recently published uh, using dynamic habitat models to look at whether we could do a better job of understanding fisheries bycatch from using satellite tracked data and linking that to the oceanography. What's been done up till now is looking at the bycatch data that's reported in log books or by observers that go on fishing boats. And that's where the animals were at sea because that's where some fishermen contacted them and killed them or caught them and released them, right? So everything, a lot of what we knew about the habitat distribution of these animals was where the fishermen encountered them, not where they are, really, okay? And so you could get the impression that this is where they are, it's where the fishermen fish, and that's not true. And in order to understand bycatch, you need to understand where they are independent of where the fishermen are because the fishermen give you one view of where they are, but there's other parts of the world that they're interested in. And so by combining um, observer, we, we, we tended to use observer data rather than logbook data because we consider it more reliable, but it's a lot less data, uh, and satellite tracking data. And so this case study um, looks at a couple of questions. How do animal distributions and fishing effort distributions relate to each other? Um, and if we combine these different data sources, can we do a better job of forecasting or understanding bycatch uh, than if we just use this, you know, view of the fishermen, basically. So the case study is Northwest Hawaiian Islands, um, and it turned out that we, we were able to tap into tracking data from a project called TOP, tagging of uh, uh, pelagic predators. Uh, Scott Schaefer um, did most of the tagging, and he captured birds in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and put satellite tags on them, and then the birds wander off and do their thing, uh, we focused on the non-breeding um, season. In other words, after they had bred and raised their chicks, 
they head off into the northern Pacific and they're not really constrained as central place foragers to come back and feed their chicks. So they can go where they think is the best place in the ocean. Uh, we also use the fisheries observer data to look at the spatial overlaps and we use the remotely sensed oceanographic data to basically develop a habitat model which tells us based on where we observe these animals in the oceanographic correlates, uh, if we can get a good statistical fit, we can also forecast in this sense, or at least hypothesize where they'll be elsewhere based on the availability of those features, okay? Now keep in mind there's a key link here that I already mentioned. We don't have the food of albatrosses in this model. That would be way cool. That's the forage fish <laughs> issue or the krill issue, um, but generally that's not reported. So we have remotely sensed oceanographic data um, with animal, animal tracking data for two species of albatrosses. And we used a dynamic habitat modeling approach to develop models that relate their occurrence um, uh, in the satellite tracking data with those, uh, with those oceanographic features. And then we related that to uh, their, uh, the probability for longline sets in those regions. The longline data we have is the US fleet only. So it's the Hawaii-based US fleet. We don't have the global online by set data. If you can get that from somewhere, let me know, because that would be cool. Um, but it gives us a first insight into this. Um, and what you get are uh, habitat models on the left, um, which show where, based on where the animals go after they're not feeding their chicks and the correlated oceanographic features, where you'd expect them to be. So the red is high suitable habitat, the blue is low suitable habitat, and then on the right um, we have the, in green the suitable habitat and the actual distribution of bird tracking fixes. So it looks pretty good, right? The birds, and you know, this shouldn't be too surprising because we're using the tracking data to generate the habitat model, but just as a cross check, there you are. But there's some things that your critical eye will say, wait a minute, there's something wrong. These black-footed albatrosses are supposed to be over here, and they're not, okay? Now, it could be they're not over here because the Hawaii-based black-footed albatrosses don't go here. But it turns out when we were thinking, oh, the model must be wrong and all that kind of stuff, we dug back into the historical archives, and there used to be populations of black-footed albatrosses there that were extirpated um, mainly by Russian, Russian uh, fishers during the era when every woman had to have a hat with feathers where a lot of the birds went. Thank God hatless feathers aren't a big deal anymore, but there are other things like plastic bottles. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so basically this provided a much better way for us to understand bycatch because in some cases we had this interesting conflict with where the fisheries were and where the birds were. Um, and uh, in this case, um, we had a, a mismatch between black-footed albatrosses and lacing albatrosses. Um, Black-footed albatrosses um, were, are, are much less common, if I'm remembering this exactly right, than laysan albatrosses, but they're caught equally in the longline fishery. So how come black-footed albatrosses, even though they're like 10 times less abundant than laysans, are caught at the same rates? And it's because their habitat distribution leads them to overlap with where the longline activity is a lot more than the laysan albatrosses. And so it begins to pull apart and help explain uh, the story. So, uh, so this analysis really helps us understand bycatch risk for black-footed albatrosses, not so much for laysan albatrosses, because it turns out when they're summer foraging, they're mostly out of the range of the U.S. longline fishery anyway, right? So their bycatch rates are relatively low. Um, this kind of uh, dynamic habitat modeling has only been done for a few species. There are uh, tens of papers at most. But it really is a valuable approach to try to help us understand this problem. Um, Brian Wallace, uh, uh, it was a really interesting case. Brian was trained as a sea turtle biologist, uh, physiologist, very careful guy. And I kept pushing him out on a limb on this project saying, so we need to have a global sea turtle bycatch estimate. And Brian said, well, there's not enough data. We're going to have to make all kinds of assumptions. And I think, this is like a $4 million project. Right? If not us, who? And if not now, when? would somebody be bold enough to make a bycatch estimate for all of the sea turtles? I mean, Andy Reid did it for marine mammals in 2006. Why are we dragging our feet here, right? Um, Brian didn't want to do it, but they finally got around to doing it. And so they reviewed, we reviewed all the global fishing data from 1990 to 2008, 
um, and uh, an estimated the bycatch from those. We didn't extrapolate any bycatch. It's just this is the bycatch reported um, in the literature for these various species, and so uh, no extrapolations. And the the thing that uh, that Brian did, which was very nice, was on these axes for um, gill nets in the top left for long lines below and for trawls over there to the right. You looked at the various um, stocks and species. Um, I think this is okay. Um, uh, for you know, basically the the relative rank of their bycatch rates and the relative uh, amount of fishing effort observed. And so you can have. It turns out some of the highest bycatch rates that have been reported in the literature are where fishing effort is very low. And in fact, that's kind of a statistical property of this data set that. Bycatch is not a kind of normally distributed process. You have zero, 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 bazillion, zero, 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 okay? So you have very high reported rates, often where the, where the data are pretty limited. When you have more data, those extremes kind of get pulled in. But it kind of showed us for different stocks of different species, which ones were experiencing the highest bycatch and which ones were experiencing the lowest bycatch. Subsequently, he has a paper, which I don't have the graphic for, which looks at from from the tagging data, from the genetics data, from the stable isotope data, the distribution of all the populations at sea for all the sea turtle species that are out there, like where are they in the North Pacific, South Pacific, North Atlantic, Indian Ocean. And you can compare these bycatch rates regionally to the genetic stocks that they're drawn from. So there's the bycatch estimate paper, there's the population structure paper, which recently came out. And there's a paper that's submitted now that puts those two together. So you can look at, for the first time, bycatch relative to risk of particular populations in particular places for sea turtles, um, which, is, which is very cool. It was one of those papers that made me smile to, to read it and see it come to fruition, especially when Brian was so res resistant about doing this. And what he's found is there are people who critique the papers absolutely. If it pisses them off enough to pull out their data, you've scored it. Because okay? they're holding on to their data, they're waiting to publish it, they think you're wrong, good. Pull it out of the damn computer and get it into the analysis. When he put this all together, uh, it's eight and a half million turtles that are taken over 19 years. Um, that's about half a million turtles reported by catch per year. But it turns out that, of course, while well, Brian's concerned about extrapolating, I'm not. So, you have to look at how much effort has been made to observe bycatch and turtles. And the typical observer programs from which you glean that data are one, two, three, five percent of the fishery. So you should multiply those figures by a factor of 10 to 100 in terms of what the real bycatch is, right? Because it would be coincidental if we happen to be getting bycatch rates in all the places where sea turtles are taken in large numbers. So watch for the paper that hopefully will come out and put those two together. Um, Jeff Moore, who is another uh, postdoc on the project, took a look at uh, fisheries bycatch for marine mammals and seabirds uh, using IUCN criteria. So he's looking at uh, the IUCN red, red list for all the seabirds, uh, odontocetes and pinnipeds um, that weren't data deficient, uh, and looking at where they are, where they're distributed relative to where we know bycatch occurs. Uh, for marine mammals, their main risk depended on how close their species tended to be to the, co to the coast where most of the fisheries are. Body size and life history characteristics also played a role. Uh, for seabirds, risk correlates with foraging behavior because that increases their susceptibility to certain fishing gears and obviously their spatial distribution and life history characteristics. And so you use statistical techniques to look at forecasting bycatch risk for endangered, for data deficient species from the species that we do understand. Um, and try to map, and this is pretty bold, at the global scale, and these boxes are the different oceanographic regions that we had in the study, um, where the greatest risk is. Uh, so this is for adoptosuits and pinnipeds, and I don't think this paper's out yet, but um, they appear to be really at, at risk in Patagonia, we have to sort of know that, the Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia, we sort of know that. Um, the Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia in particular, we have very little information on the intensity of the fishery. In our global long line effort survey, the Indian Ocean had, at that point, no long line estimates of how much long line gear there is. So based on the distribution of the species, 
um, the, the species that are likely to be in the greatest trouble are in regions where we have very little understanding of the fishery, right? So if you're all else being equal, if you're an adventurous student, go there, okay? Uh, there's a lot of work going on in Patagonia, thankfully, uh, but the Indian Ocean, uh, parts of Southeast Asia are pretty intensive, but not a lot. That doesn't leave other parts of the, the almost the entire African coastline is in a middle kind of scale. There are lots of marine mammals that are at risk in those regions and poorly known fisheries. And in this study, when we encountered and uh, talked to a lot of countries and NGOs in countries, we'd say, so we were originally interested in bycatch, but let's back up. Let's talk about just how many fishermen do you have? And what kind of boats do they have? And what kind of gear do they have? And they said, we don't know if you find out, could you call us <laughs> and tell us? And so we ended up developing a survey tool that we used with NGOs in seven different countries to get a first kind of rapid assessment of even the magnitude of the small scale fisheries. The industrial fisheries that report out to the international statistics, you've got whatever reality you choose to put in the FAO data, at least it's there, uh, but for the small scale fisheries, virtually nothing. And for seabird data, these are the, the polygons, and you can see they're really big. Uh, uh, there are a lot of seabirds in the southern hemisphere uh, and the southern ocean, uh, and there are also very active fisheries in those regions. And so um, this is an area where we know the animals are at high risk, and a lot of those um, albatrosses and petrels and carnal safina could tell you the rest of the story are really in trouble in these regions of the world. And um, even though we know in detail the population dynamics of some species, there are other species about which we know almost nothing. But we can say from their life history, from their habitat affinities, from their foraging behavior, and the, the intensity of the risk in those regions, we know those regions are going to be risky across the board for species well understood and poorly understood. Okay, so in thinking about how to do this, we realized we have to characterize bycatch uh, at a variety of different scales. Um, we have to understand the spatial and temporal patterns. In other words, the average bycatch is zero. Okay, so that's not a very interesting problem. And in fact, when you go to the fishermen, the fishermen said, I remember a fisherman in the Gulf of Mexico, a trawler, and before they were feeling totally politically pressured about turtle excluder devices, they would still talk to you, right? And you'd say, well, so there are a lot of people who have their undies in a bundle about bycatch of sea turtles. How many sea turtles do you catch? And he would say, uh, you know, I don't know what the problem is. I catch maybe two or three a year, right? And he could be quite honest, actually, but there were 15,000 shrimpers in the Gulf of Mexico at that time. So small impact for individuals scaled up. It's like the impact of marine recreational fishing. I catch a half a dozen striped bass a year times 15 million recreational fishermen. It can still be a big effect, right, when you accumulate it. Um, so it's important to think about those issues. The underlying oceanography is critical to understand this whole thing, so it's not uh, dolphin huggers without knowing that we really need to understand the details of the productivity and the function of these systems. And of course the goal is to inform management and help reverse declines of some of these long-lived species while keeping fisheries in business. I mean, I've never been interested in uh, closing global fisheries. I want to figure out how to make fisheries sustainable with habitats and ecosystems and species that other people care about besides just the market. So some of the things that we've worked on and there are papers out and in the works on this, the global biogeography of bycatch, where in the world does bycatch occur? And it occurs in particular places, often at scales lower than our current remote sensing, and like in oceanographic features that you need to like scope in. Um, there, are, we, we, we talked about you know, the deadliest catch shelf, the deadliest gear, and it turns out the deadliest gear is the answer is it depends. The seabird people are frantic about long lines, and they said, let's get rid of these long lines and have bottom set gill nets. And then the marine mammal people are frantic about bottom set gill nets, right? So whenever you make a fisheries management decision, you have to think about what will the fishermen do next. They don't just hang it up and go home. They fish another gear, they fish another place, they go some they're fishermen, right? So I, I've said this many times to people, I'll use the joke on you. If we managed fishery, if we played chess the way we managed fisheries, we'd get our butts kicked most of the time, right? Because we seldom think through what the next move will be from an action that we take. 
um, estimating bycatch per unit effort by deer type and taxon, and trying to identify in the world where the global hotspots are uh, for bycatch. And, um, and there's the potential for some really creative thinking that we're actually working on now. You've all heard about marine protected areas, right? Or even totally protected marine reserves, no take. Those usually are locked down in two dimensions on a map over a coral reef or a kelp forest or a sea mount or something like that. What if we had dynamic marine protected areas that move seasonally? What if they move with the probability density function of the organism you're trying to protect? Like some of the court cases that I was involved in on sea turtle protection in the North Pacific closed huge areas of the North Pacific because we didn't understand enough about where the turtles were and where the fishermen were. If you understand at a, a higher scale of, scale of resolution, you can say the turtles are mostly in this cloud during May and they're here, in June they're here, in July they're here. So you don't have to close the whole world. You close the train wreck. Or you reduce the train wreck possibilities. And uh, I'm crazy enough, the first paper I read on this was David Hiram Box paper in the year 2000 and I thought it was crazy. Now I'm going too crazy. I think it's a potentially good idea. Um, Take a little sidebar into small scale fisheries because this totally blindsided me. Everybody who was working on bycatch at the time thought the big bycatchers are in the large scale industrial fisheries because they catch so many fish, they use such powerful gear, they go all, all over the world. This is a study that Hoyt Peckham, uh, and I, was, I ended up becoming co author on this. He was studying these two fishing villages in Santa Rosa and Puerto Lopez Mateos, beautiful places, beautiful people. They fish from small pongas. Um, for for uh, Santa Rosa at the time, uh, bottom set long lines for Puerto Lopez Mateos gill nets, and they roll out in these. Uh, they go out in these small uh, outboard powered pongas, and they set for sharks or mahi mahi or whatever they're targeting at different seasons. Um, and Hoyt uh, started working with Jay Nichols and subsequently followed up. In this area right here, there are turtle uh, loggerhead turtles that wash up on the beach. And the nearest loggerhead turtle production is in Japan. So these turtles are produced in Japan. They come all the way over to Mexico and they have a nursery habitat here in, a, in Mejia de Aloha. The upwelling zone there is persistent. It's there from year to year. They probably spend decades there. And it turns out that these two fisheries uh, have the highest bycatch, in, bycatch rates in the world that have been reported. These two fisheries at the time that Hoyt uh, finished this study, we're taking as many loggerheads as the entire North Pacific industrial long line fleet. And I'm going, duh, or duh, Homer Simpson. You know, you can't overlook small scale fisheries. They could have a very large bycatch impact, okay? And we've totally focused till now on these offshore large scale fisheries. This one has a really interesting story because Hoyt has lived and worked in this community uh, of pathways that he's taken to solutions with these fishermen, not saying, well, let's close this area as a global protected area for sea turtles and exclude the fishermen. No, to work with the fishermen to alter how they fish. So um, the, the really interesting story here, and this is just about done, is because Hoyt, which is, who's on the right there, worked so closely with the fishermen, um, he would do really out, off, out of the box thinking taking the fishermen from Mexico to a meeting in Hawaii where they met with the longline fishermen who were being constrained under current regulatory procedures and the Japanese turtle biologists that were working the nesting beaches to try to recover these populations. They all get together in Hawaii and they begin thinking, talking about this story. And the, the, the crashing trend in the populations of the loggerheads produced in Japan, the massive constraints that have been put on the US longline fleet in Hawaii, and, and this guy, um, El Jefe, Senior de la Paz here, stood up in the meeting and he said, I had no idea that we were having this kind of impact on this global resource. As the spokesperson for this community, I can tell you, we're gonna stop one line. Nobody paid him off, nobody required him under law to do it. When he understood his role in this system, he thought the honorable thing to do was to get out of one line. They retired their long lines, a, a rack of them is just behind them there, um, saving 700 loggerheads a year right off the stop, okay, as a cooperative thing. They're still fishing, but they're fishing hook and line. 
and other gears and so on. So the long lines are gone and the turtle bycatch rates, at least for the moment, were reduced. Um, similar shifts are occurring in the gillnet fishery. Uh, I, I just got an email from Point a couple days ago. This summer is not a happy story. That's a three year story. Uh, so I have to get, get that one from me later. But working in local communities sometimes uh, presents opportunities for solutions uh, that you can't get other ways. Um, so this is uh, the IUCN listed species vulnerability and bycatch again. They're just a large, you saw this one, just, just, there are large parts of the world where we have no sense of the bycatch, the magnitude of the fishery, and particularly the potential impact of small scale fisheries. As I mentioned, one of the things we did on Project Global was survey people in country in various African nations, Southeast Asian nations, South American nations, Caribbean nations, there were only seven nations that we could afford to do this in. And we got an estimate of how many boats, how much gear, what kind of gear do they use, what are they targeting, do they ever see a sea turtle? And we didn't really talk about bycatch to them. We said, do you ever catch turtles? And if you take that survey information and you put it together, it suggests really like scary, frightening potential for bycatch in the small scale fisheries. And the reason for doing the rapid assessment is just to do the assay, do the ore assay, like there are hundreds of thousands of small scale fisheries. If you wanted to study something that's really important, where would you go? What kind of oceanographic creatures, what kind of fishing gear, um, and something initial about the bycatch. And so um, I just came from uh, something, something, a new international network called Too Big to Ignore. Uh, it's people from uh, 62 scientists from 27 different institutions that are beginning work on small scale fisheries for the first time. I think it's going to be really exciting. Um, just to wrap up here, there are, there are ways to mitigate this problem with bycatch conservation technologies that you can use that are promising. There are ways um, to consider spatial management or changes in fishing practices, um, not just fishing quotas, but bycatch quotas. There are market-based approaches to provide incentives for fishermen to shift their behaviors. There are lots of different avenues, and there's no one best way to do this. It's going to have to be designed based on alternatives that will work in a particular setting. A lot of gear fixes for bycatch are out there, but they're not being used. So it's not like we don't have an approach to do this. They're just not being used. And so getting them done is really challenging. The stuff I've talked about was done by tens of people, not hundreds, but tens of people. And, uh, and I'm just kind of telling their story. So thank you. on circle hooks has really been excellent. Um, they, they, you know, I think, measurably now uh, reduce bycatch, of especially turtles that, that take the hook, like waterheads. Um, there are also some utility in changing baits from squid to chunks of fish, which the turtles seem to really like squid. Um, there, are, there are setting procedures you can use, setting at different depths, setting in the day instead of the night, or not using light sticks or using light sticks. So people have fiddled with those things, and I think it's beyond at the margins. You know, I mean, there's real progress uh, from these approaches. Um, the, the problem is thinking that there is a silver bullet. Like, it, you know, if you're if you're if you're past Disney, there's no that quick answer to any of these problems. There there are issues that need to be worked out in each setting. And so I'd say circle hooks is our last step. There are people who are saying problem solved. I'm not there yet. Um, and, uh, and gill nets are a particular problem because there's no fix for gill nets that's even been proposed that seems reasonable. And any of those gear technologies only work if you, in fact, use them. So, you know, Tara Cox published a paper from Project Global called Conservation Technology Bycatch Reduction, the real and the, the, I guess, the, the, the estimated and the real. I mean, in practice, in fisheries, Gears that prove reduce bycatch by 90%, reduce bycatch by 40%. Because they're not used, they're not enforced, they're not installed properly, and things like that. So having a solution that's tested, that's validated, that you can use, doesn't mean it's having an intended effect in the ocean. Have you ever seen a turtle 
maybe one more question. Okay, well, I want to remind everyone that there's lunch over in the Okubo room and you can uh, talk to Larry from there. So thank you very much, Larry. <laughs>